Welcome back to our study called Two Camps, and we're looking at Genesis chapter 32, 1 through 23. This uh, little section today is called The Prayer of Need, and we're looking at 9 through 12. And, uh, you know, Jacob is in fear, he's scared, Esau's coming with 400 men, what is he going to do? And so he's made a plan, but then he goes to God for help. Let's look at the address that he first, who does he address here in this? In this prayer, he does not call upon the angels whom he had seen on the road or other gods of Mesopotamia like Laban does. Instead, he cries out to God of his father Abraham and his father Isaac. Again, there is a sense of humility in the very way he addresses God. Also, in reference to his father and grandfather, he's calling upon the God who entered into a covenant with them and promised to keep the covenant. He also addresses God as Yahweh or Jehovah, who said to me, Return to your country and kindred, that I may do you good. Now Jacob uses the divine name, the, the covenant name, and repeats the command to go that was given to him. And so Jacob addresses the covenant God of his fathers and the God that spoke to him and told him to go. This is the God who he's addressing. This is the God who's, he's, who he is invoking and what he will ask in a minute. Uh, so Jacob addresses God, Yahweh God, and then he begins a section of thanksgiving. You know, Jacob admits that he is not worthy of the least of all the deeds of steadfast love and all the faithfulness that was shown to him. Jacob, the heel grabber, now fully admits that he is unworthy of all that God has done for him. You know, before he was trying to, you know, he deceived his his father to get the promise. But now he's saying, oh, I, haven't, I don't deserve anything that I've gotten from you. So Jacob admits that when he left Canaan, only the only thing he had was a staff. And now his return, he has enough to create two camps. It's really a rags to riches story. And Jacob has been made humble by it. He's not... He's not bragging. He doesn't talk about himself. He says, I don't deserve any of this steadfast love or, or the faithfulness that you've shown me. You know, I, I have done nothing to earn this. And he's, you know, thanking God for his grace. That's the right answer. That's, that's what you need to do. Now that he's addressed God, now that he's offered his thanksgiving, now he enters into his petition. He's going to ask God something. And his petition is, please deliver me from Esau for I fear him. The people of God have always gone to God with their fears, as they should, as they've been told to. Throughout Scripture, we find the command to go to God when we're afraid or when we have anxiety. You know, cast all your cares. You know, pray about your anxieties. So, in fact, God would command through the Apostle Paul exactly what Jacob does here. Remember Philippians 4, 6, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known to God. That's exactly what Jacob does. He goes to God in prayer with supplications and with thanksgivings. There you go. So Paul is really just copying what Jacob did. And now at the end of his prayer, he goes back to the promises of God. Jacob finishes his prayer with the very promises of God that God had given God said to Jacob when he was at Bethel 20 years prior that he was with him and would keep him wherever he went. He also states the promise of God that he would make his offspring as the sand of the sea. Now at Bethel, God told Jacob that his offspring would be like the dust of the earth. We don't have recorded in scripture that God says that Jacob's offspring, that, ja that God went to Jacob and said that he, his offspring would be like the sand of the sea, right? We don't have that recorded in scripture. Now, that this is an argument from silence, right? Because since we don't have it, doesn't mean it didn't happen. You know, it doesn't mean that he's not quoting something that God, you know, told him specifically, maybe a different time, but it's not recorded in the scripture. That's a possibility. Or the other possibility is that he is actually quoting Genesis twenty-two seventeen, 17, where God makes the promise to Abraham. And so Jacob really is then claiming the covenantal promise to Abraham that passed to Isaac and then passed on to him. Which makes sense because that's what these men are doing. They are claiming the promises of God. He, the promise was given to Abraham. 
right? And to his offspring. So it's like, and this is Abraham's promise, but then the promise passes to his heirs, to his offspring. And we see that. Paul makes that point in Galatians chapter 3. Uh, he says, if we are Christ's, then we are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. So he's saying in Galatians chapter 3 there, that if you are Jesus Christ, the promises that were given to Abraham went to Christ. And if you were in Christ, if you are an heir of Christ, because you're a follower of him, you're a believer in him, you are a Christian, then that means that you have received those promises. Those promises, the Abraham promise, the Abrahamic promise, is your promise. So, uh, I think Jacob here is going back and saying, you promised to Abraham, to Isaac, to me, to all heirs, that our our offspring would be as numerous as the sea. So if Esau is coming and he's going to destroy and wipe me out, then the promise is done. Uh, so, you know, he's almost as if you're reminding God. You know, you don't have to remind God, but you're recalling back to your own mind too and saying, you promised this God. I'm asking you to now act according to your promise. And God will, of course. That's why you can pray that prayer and have it answered every time. You know, act according to your promise, God. Okay, you know, so you're not asking him something he didn't already say he was going to do. So that's a prayer you can always pray and always have answered because he said that's what's going to happen. So that's what Jacob does. He enters in this time of prayer. That's the right answer, right? Our boy Jacob is growing. He's maturing in his faith. And uh, now he's, you know, he's an old man, obviously. Uh, he's pushing 100. And that's, uh, you know, change. That's growth. That's spiritual growth. That's sanctification right there. He's becoming a holy man of God. And God's been working on him for 20 years. And he's learned that everything he's gotten is not because of him. And he needs to pray because he's afraid. And um, so we need to follow that example, right? That's a good example. Not all examples in the Bible are good, but in this part, in this section, he's doing what he ought to be doing, and we need to follow suit. So we'll come back next time. We'll look at verses 13 through 23, kind of finish up looking at the text of this study. So come back next time.